Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today for Metalcon Live. I'm Judy Geller, Director of Metalcon, and I am here today with Kaylin Burke at the controls. Today, the Metalcon and the Metal Construction Association are happy to be bringing you thermal breaks in cladding support attachment assemblies. It's presented by Belil. This is presented by Belil Khan of Northern Facades. <laughs> I apologize for this little issue we're having currently. Uh, he is the architectural products consultant from Northern Facades. So a couple of things before we get started today. Um, the next Metalcon Live is on March 2nd when the MBCE, with the MBCEA's Keith Wentworth, VP at Dutton and Garfield, and he will be presenting temporary bracing guidelines. Um, this session today is accredited by the AIA for architects. So for details and how to register and visit, look for our email and we will be sending that later today so you can receive all of your credits. Today's presentation is brought to you by the MCA among their long list of benefits is a 10% off discount currently happening on exhibiting at Metalcon. Please contact Jeff Irwin for details. He will be happy to help you in any way possible. Also, the Metalcon 2022 call for presentations deadline is on Friday, February 18th. If you're an expert in a topic that would be of interest or it would be of high educational value for contractors, subcontractors, architects, designers, or installers, and others in the metal construction industry, we invite you to apply. And of course, make sure that Metalcon is on your calendar for 2022, October 12th through the 14th at the Indiana Convention Center in Indianapolis. The Midwest is an important region for metal products, manufacturing, and metalworking technology. And we have not been there for a very long time and is also an area for fun. Last week on a site visit, myself and the rest of our team toured the Indy 500 Speedway Museum and the NCAA headquarters and its museum. Both are amazing, whether you're an attendee touring the city or an exhibitor looking for an affordable and fun venue to host customers. Please contact Judy at metalcon.com for more information. Again, that's Judy at metalcon.com for more information. To get all the early info and news about Metalcon 2022, you can re-register at metalcon.com. And last but surely not least, just a quick reminder, if you have any technical issues, you can reach out to Metalcon Live in the chat box and I'll be the one to assist you. Again, today to receive your AIA credits, please fill out the form immediately following this survey. We'll be sure to process those for you. All questions can be submitted either in the chat feature or in the Q&A feature on this screen right now. You can submit those at any point in time throughout this entire session, and we will review those at appropriate times. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna hand this right over to Bilal. Bilal, take it away. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you, Judy. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, joining me today and talking about thermal breaks and cladding support attachment assemblies. Um, I'll just go over really quickly on some AIA best practices as I'm obliged to just before we get into uh, the presentation. Uh, this program is registered with the AIA Continuing Education uh, for uh, Professional Education. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by the AIA of any material of construction or any method or manner of handling, using or distributing or dealing in any material or product. Questions related to specific materials, methods and services will be addressed at the conclusion of this presentation. Northern Facades is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to CES records for AIA members. Net zero energy ready buildings are becoming a popular topic in today's climate changing world. 
Um, energy efficiency in high performing building envelopes drive a lot of design conversations and generally construction is moving towards thermally broken subframing systems, um, which are rapidly becoming a new norm. This course will help participants understand how the use of thermal clips will impact thermal bridging uh, on various exterior wall assembly applications, identify and compare various cladding attachment methods on the market, help participants learn how to determine the appropriate clip for your project, compare effective thermal resistance required to achieve projects targeted R value. My name is Bilal Khan, uh, and I am an architectural product consultant at Mohawk Facades. Uh, but I'm really, uh, I really like to look at myself as a resource to architects, designers, and engineers uh, with all things related to facades. Um, given my background, I really enjoy solving problems and getting into the details. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I, ho I hope you all uh, have a great session through this presentation and uh, uh, find value in, uh, the, in, 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 the, in the things that we've learned uh, throughout the years. So I want to start off the presentation with just creating a little bit of a context. 88% um, of energy sources um, uh, are non-renewable and harmful for, um, uh, for, the, for the climate. Now, this is just a synopsis of where energy is currently being sourced in the United States. Um, and as we all know that if our energy is not renewable, uh, it could cause adverse climate change effects um, that we're all experiencing, um, such as snowstorms in, in Texas, uh, et cetera. Um, buildings that we live in require energy for all kinds of different things. And it could range from things like cooking and refrigeration, running motors and electrical devices, um, or even, even lighting. But the single biggest end use is space heating, which accounts for 42% of residential buildings and 36% and for commercial buildings. Commercial buildings also spend $27 billion or 15% annually just to heat their buildings. And all of this sort of data is just to kind of create this sense of our understanding of how our energy is being sourced or uh, produced, and how do we consume them? And given that, we would want to believe that uh, building occupants would be pretty happy or pretty satisfied with the thermal comfort of their buildings, right? However, um, uh, we stumbled upon a survey that says, no, it, that's actually not the case. Uh, actually, uh, thermal comfort is, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a negative or dissatisfied zone. In a study conducted at UC Berkeley, we learned that a modern building performance is mediocre at best. Uh, and if you look closely at the sources of dissatisfaction with uh, temperature, um, we will see opinions like my area is hotter or colder than the other areas or air movement uh, is too low or even heating and cooling systems do not respond quickly enough, um, which are all telltale signs of overall failure of the building to maintain temperature consistency, which um, leads us to believe that buildings are perhaps not performing at the level at which they were designed to, or if they were even designed to a standard, and that most commercial buildings are experiencing drastic heat loss. So before we understand how buildings lose heat, we need to kind of understand TEDI or thermal energy demand intensity. TEDI is a measure of the amount of annual heat, heating energy needed to maintain um, a building stable interior temperature. And it takes into account heat loss through the envelope and passive gains such as warmth generated by sunlight, body heat and appliances, et cetera. By targeting low TEDI, Designers focus on passive solutions, or designers can focus on passive solutions like good insulation, air tightness, and beneficial sun angles that can help reduce energy used directly. Looking at these passive design aspects are always the first step in high performance design. To 
to minimize heat loss from buildings, it is very important to design highly insulated building, design with highly insulated buildings, uh, building assemblies, and have more exterior insulation or split insulation um, uh, in wall cavities. But either of those two strategies fail if we fail to recognize the impact of thermal bridging across building envelope. So let's take a closer look at what thermal bridging entails. Um, this is mostly a refresher, as I'm sure everyone present at this webinar knows what thermal bridging is. But just for context, a thermal bridge is an example of heat transfer through conduction, plain and simple. When there is a temperature difference, heat flow will follow the path of least resistance through the material with the highest thermal conductivity and lowest thermal resistance. This path is a thermal bridge. Thermal bridging is caused by highly conductive elements penetrating the thermal insulation and or misaligned planes of thermal insulation. These paths allow heat flow to bypass the insulating layer and reduce the effectiveness of the insulation. Thermal bridges can occur through walls, roofs, and other um, insulated building envelope components through linear transmittance of floor slabs through point transmittance of structural elements and clear field assemblies. That is transmittance, which occurs due to the effect of uniformly distributed um, thermal bridging components um, like brick ties, structural framing, um, uh, products like steel studs or studs in general and cladding attachments. Um, this presentation is going to focus exclusively on thermal bridges created through a clear field assembly. Thermal bridging is common to many forms of conventional construction. Prior to detailed studies of thermal bridging in building enclosures, assembly designers uh, did not necessarily pay attention to heat flow by conduction through steel studs and reinforced concrete structures that did not benefit from continuous ins exterior insulation. One of the best ways by far to suck energy across the wall is a steel stud. Um, I mean, you know, just look at the configuration. It's a highly conductive material that's designed for maximum absorption on one end and maximum emission on the other end. And it really doesn't get any better than this for heat loss or heat gain. Whether this assembly is insulated internally from a thermal perspective is irrelevant, as there are studies that uh, were conducted that were uh, where we see steel stud walls with no stud cavity insulation and a wall with cavity insulation. And when we compare them, uh, you would not be able to tell the difference in thermal performance between the experimental area of measurement. Hence, the need for insulation on the exterior is uh, the case, I guess, I should say, it made for exterior insulation on the exterior is, is more, um, uh, has more, 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 more legs to stand on than we think. Here's another look at, um, at the thermal bridge. Now you can see how the path of thermal transfer goes from the steel studs on to, from the inside of the building via continuous Z -gird. And the only way efficiently to and effectively to minimize this heat loss is through installing a is uh, to install installing a continuous exterior insulation. As thermal bridges can occur throughout the building envelope, one strategy to combat them is continuous insulation. And this is not just your standard procedure of cutting insulation to tightly fit into the walls and taping them together through uh, though this is an important uh, you know, measure to ensure uh, insulation's effectiveness, uh, but continuous insulation is installed on the exterior side of the walls. So it isn't broken up by wall components, except for service openings and fasteners as it's allowed for in the building code. In multi-story buildings, interior insulation can not be continuous. I mean, that's something that we've learned over the years uh, through perhaps uh, uh, many experimentation.
However, in order to meet the building code standards that require continuous insulation, as many codes now do, the insulation must be installed over wood studs and before uh, sheathing. Uh, exposed slabs can act as thermal bridges that can increase uh, a building's U value by 1%, especially when uh, repeating continuous insulation is the best strategy to combat this. So let's break down the concept of continuous insulation. Insulation is measured in R values or resistive values. A section of this insulation is, uh, uh, or a section of any insulation is roughly 3.1 uh, R per inch. Uh, and this is a nominal value. Um, meaning it's R value and without it being installed in a wall assembly. But what designers need to consider is the effective value, which considers the R value of the insulation after it is installed in the wall assembly and accounts for penetrations and other thermal bridging components um, that are penetrating it. So let's take an example. Um, uh, let's take an example of six inch bat insulation, which is rated R19 nominally, uh, roughly 3.1 per inch. Uh, however, as soon as, uh, as soon as we add uh, steel studs through this, its performance diminishes to as low as R7.1, which, uh, uh, we call the effective R value, meaning that when steel, meaning meaning that with steel studs, um, designers would have to add around three times more insulation to bring it up to its R19 value, which poses some serious design challenges and within the stud cavity, as you can imagine. Um, so we resolve this exterior insulation, uh, where as soon as uh, we add continuous insulation on the outboard of sheathing we can get an effective R value of roughly 23 or even more, depending on how much exterior insulation we want to layer up. Um, and we can get higher performance wall provided that it is thermally broken uh, through a cladding attachment strategy. Here's an excellent representation of uh, uh, insulation in the stud cavity. Um, the wall on the left side shows absolutely no resistance to the heat flowing uh, to the outside of the building, whereas the wall assembly uh, is definitely better performing on the right hand side, and you can clearly see that it's, it's, a, it's a much better performing wall. Um, so addressing thermal bridging is important during the design detailing stage because it can result in increased energy required to heat or cool the buildings to accommodate for winter heat loss and summer heat gain. As we all know that energy conservation is a hot topic as building codes are increasingly becoming performance oriented. Um, so let's just kind of take a little bit of a stroll into the building codes and see why is it so important for us to perhaps um, uh, consider thermal bridging in exterior building uh, uh, in exterior building envelopes. Um, so in USA, there are two predominant building codes, uh, the IECC 2021 and ASHRAE 90.1. There are different versions and adaptions of these codes um, and standards in effect across different states um, and cities in USA. However, all require consideration for thermal bridging and effectiveness of insulation, or at least are moving in that direction. Uh, and then on top of that, there are green building codes such as ASHRAE 189.1, IGCC, uh, and the voluntary programs like Passive House, LEED, raise the bar even further for high performance building envelopes. And one thing to note is that wall effectiveness, R value and U value are integral part of energy code compliance. Um, Outboard continuous uh, insulation presents an efficient and cost-effective method to meet thermal performance set out in these standards, 
However, the effectiveness of this approach hinges on the selection of a thermally efficient cladding attachment strategy and detailing, which we will get to in a minute. Um, another thing to note is that cladding attachments can be significant thermal bridge um, if they are not thermally broken and can reduce the exterior insulation performance as little uh, as five to 10% in high performance systems, um, uh, mechanical or otherwise, and as much as 80% for poor systems that are in need for major retrofit. With the updated code, all buildings energy efficiency, both commercial and residential, is estimated to rise about 10%. And high standards for increased continuous insulation requirements will help commercial buildings become more energy efficient. In the 2021 commercial code, commercial buildings are required to display an energy efficient certificate that lists our values of uh, the insulation. And numerous updates have also been made to better align um, ASHRAE 90.1 um, to the current code. Uh, uh, and these changes include um, uh, updates to roofing assembly performance and above grade wall assembly performance through continuous insulation. So just a quick synopsis of what the changes kind of look like. Um, overall, there's an average 49% increase in effective R value for above grade wall assembly, which specifically calls out continuous insulation. Uh, and there is stress on exterior insulation versus cavity insulation. And with these, with the way the insulation, um, uh, with the way the R value or the performance criteria has increased with the IECC 2021, it's very difficult to just achieve R values or just just, just achieve performance criteria with within stud cavity insulation alone. Uh, and if it has to be exterior insulation, it needs to be with a proper cladding attachment strategy. There is no doubt about that. The status of energy code adoption in commercial buildings is, uh, is, is very rapid from, from the standpoint that we are looking at it. And there are many states that have already moved on to the ASHRAE 90.1 code, um, the 2016, which is the latest version. Um, uh, and, and most states are slowly and gradually moving towards that standard as well. And as required for energy efficiency to become more demanding, the, pri the, uh, the primary role of the enclosure is becoming recognized as the most cost-effective means of attaining high-performance targets. The table here indicates recommended effective R values for various enclosure components for use various components used in residential buildings. These are effective R values that account for thermal bridging effects. The table here indicates recommended effective R values for various enclosure components for those used in steel stud uh, commercial construction. These are again, effective R values that account for thermal bridging effects. The challenge designers and contractors face is in selecting and evaluating an appropriate cladding attachment strategy for their project and understanding the implications these decisions have on effective thermal performance, installation methods, sequencing, and system cost. These are just a sampling of the different products that are out there. So as you can imagine, there are several different products, uh, all having their own uh, pros and cons, um, uh, uh, their own acceptable uh, standards and the way they're probably um, uh, better or worse in a given situation. But what's really consistent across the board is that all these systems work on the principle of enabling a thermal bridged subframing system that enables continuous insulation. The nuances of each system vary by detailing ins installation techniques and system cost, which we'll get into in a little bit. 
typically the thermal bridging is buried within the insulation layers and um, which allow which which stops from heat flow to pass on to the subframing and it prevents any cool air from transferring into the building. And as I mentioned, there are so many different clip and rail systems on the market, which ones should architects focus on or what's the criteria to even start to evaluate them. Uh, so I wanna start with the point that there is really, all clip systems aren't the same. They all have different nuances. And how do you pick or how do you start selecting them? Well, there are independent analysis, such as this one that I'll go through by independent um, uh, engineering company, RDH, that evaluates, and there are many others that are out there, that evaluate system performance and design performance of uh, many of these clips. It looks at structural uh, strength and it looks at the thermal performance. And different materials and different combinations of materials have a have all have a play on the performance of the building. And it's really up to the designer and it's really up to the project standards to determine which clip would be most appropriate for detailing the type of cladding attachment system that um, the designers want at the end of the day. <clears throat> um, the analysis that RDH came up with that uh, from a starting point, having a thermal bridging strategy in place is a good thing. Um, but within that, there are good, better, and best solutions that are out there. Uh, so although you'll notice that there are various systems and performance are quite relative in terms in the, in the best category, um, uh, it is not a full picture as performance analysis does not consider constructability and relative cost. So on the right side of the screen, you'll notice that there is a relative cost of the system, which is just to procure the products. Uh, there is a performance standard, which the project has to meet. And then there's constructability of how easy it is for construction crews to install the system and whether or not it is compatible with the project timelines. Is it a fast paced project where there are um, prefabricated wall panels and they really need the building up in the building facade up in three months? Uh, or it is a custom residential project or a custom project that requires very extensive and elaborate uh, cladding uh, system or a versatile cladding system that's adjustable. Um, so that those are all dependent on, on the project specific criteria. The table here shows the percentage effectiveness of exterior insulation with various cladding support systems and the typical thickness of exterior insulation roughly from two inches to eight inches that goes from R8 to R40 in R value. It is apparent that traditional techniques such as Ziegert's can at best achieve about 50% of exterior insulation effectiveness, essentially requiring <clears throat> us to double the thickness of exterior insulation to achieve an effective thermal resistance that approaches the nominal value. High performance buildings require high performance enclosures that manage heat flow effectively. The proper selection, arrangement, detailing, and integration of the enclosure components and assemblies to maintain the continuity of thermal insulation and the air barrier system are no longer best practice, but a standard practice and they and need, need it to be complied with the codes and the standards. So, uh, I'm not saying that it's a big deal, but it is a pretty big deal. Um, so just looking at some high performance buildings here and just kind of looking at it from a hydrothermal uh, perspective uh, through thermal imaging. And you can see that um, uh, uh, in this image, you know, before a building's leaking severe excessive amounts of heat and you can see that the entire building envelope is just completely lit up, uh, whereas, after a retrofit of the exact same building, you will notice that heat is not finding a lot of opportunities to escape through the building facade, which is quite interesting and, and a very real analysis of what high performance buildings look like and what continuous insulation uh, can do for, uh, for, for making that building high performing. In another example, this is kind of a colder area and you can see the mountains with snow in the background. 
And you can really see how effective exterior insulation is in this case, where it's really limiting the flow of heat. You can only see it on the corners and some glazing, and some window areas um, where it's probably penetrating from. And even that warrants further investigation, whether or not that is uh, a, a component inside that's showing that or not. But if you look at the buildings on the further left or the further right, you will see that those are not high performing and therefore are leaking excessive amounts of heat. Uh, thermal insulation uh, and wild control of moisture is practically a universal requirement for buildings. The importance of control of heat transfer tends to become more critical as the severity of climate, either hot or cold, increases. And managing heat flow is critical to occupant thermal comfort, energy efficiency, durability, and increasingly thermal resilience during periods of extended power outages as we continue to experience as climate change sort of takes effect. Uh, the primary impact of a thermal bridge is that it will allow conditioned air to leave the building and losing heat in cold weather and gaining heat in hot weather. This may have a significant impact on the comfort of the occupants, not just the overall temperature that they experience, but also when they touch the colder or hotter than average walls and floors. Um, if your building must maintain a certain temperature, whether it's room temperature for people or a specific temperature for stored goods, a thermal bridge can make it more expensive to maintain that temperature. Um, thermal bridges allow for, for warm air to mingle with the colder air. Um, they frequently in, encourage condensation. Uh, this effect is more pronounced in areas with high humidity than in areas with relatively low humidity. When condensation occurs in a building, it has many effects on air quality. Um, uh, it, could, it could allow for mold to grow and negatively impact the health of building occupants, especially those with breathing problems. Uh, constant dampness may cause um, damage to drywalls and furniture and other items. And probably the most, the biggest and most expensive gremlin of all is interstitial condensation. Um, from a thermal bridge uh, standpoint, um, it may not necessarily end up in the exterior of the building. Instead, it may just collect in between the walls and other building elements. Um, and, and it has some serious impacts on longevity of a building in question. Um, wherever moisture collects, rot and rust may follow. So if you cannot see the condensation because it is uh, in the walls or pipes, you may not be able to fix it in time or address it in time and, and, and it would have caused severe damage to the building structure. Uh, in climates with cold season, it is advisable to place all of the insulation on the exterior of the air leakage control plane to manage the risk of condensation due to air leakage. However, this makes energy efficient walls very thick. And an alternative approach is to combine interior and exterior insulation in proper proportions to manage moisture. There are um, several considerations which must be made, which must be made in, in order to, um, uh, or in choosing the type of exterior insulation and cladding attachment strategy for a building. Uh, these typically include at a minimum different loads, um, either dead load, wind load, or pull out resistance, uh, backup wall construction, whether it's wood, wood, concrete, or concrete blocks, steel stud framing, structural attachment point, uh, whether it's through studs or sheathing or slab edge, outboard insulation thickness and types of insulation. But in addition to these requirements, there are performance requirements that come with all these new standards and codes or ever evolving standards and codes, uh, which ask questions such as what is the effective R value uh, target and tolerable thermal efficiency loss from supports? Um, what is the orientation of the subframing system? Either it's vertical, horizontal, uh, and what are the required attachment points? Uh, it is super important to consider details for attachments of cladding at corners, transitions, returns, and penetrations, and combustibility requirements. Oops. Uh, 
there are three major structural forces when considering with facades or 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 uh, uh, considering um, cladding attachment strategy, uh, thermally broken strat uh, cladding attachment strategy. Uh, and those are wind load, dead load, and pullout resistance. Wind load and dead load impact the spacing of the system. Uh, uh, pullout resistance is a uh, uh, measure of uh, the fasteners and the type of fasteners used to fasten the, the, the subframing system to the wall. Um, spacing of the attachments uh, uh, has many different implications and uh, each product has a different load charge. Each manufacturer has different load charts that uh, designers and, and installers can rely on. Um, uh, and, and, and these, these um, uh, variables are either broken down by wind load, weight of the cladding system, uh, the type of girt assembly that's required, uh, substrate uh, on, upon which the system is being fastened on, and the depth of the insulation. However, the project engineer on record must verify the clip spacing based off of the manufacturer's recommendation and sign off before anything can be done. Uh, this is just an example of a typical load chart and type of data that you can find um, with manufacturers. <clears throat> And depending on the thermal attachment, there are many different uh, uh, girt and fastener approaches. And some thermal attachments use one type uh, and, and uh, adjust the girt size to accommodate different insulation thicknesses, while others have different size attachments for different insulation thicknesses. Um, some, uh, uh, some products are adjustable that require no shims and uh, while others require for different kinds of uh, attachments to accommodate for horizontal or even vertical insulation. So there's many different flavors. Like I said, no, no two thermal clips or, or thermal bridging, thermal clips uh, or thermal attachment uh, uh, systems are the same. Um, uh, it's important to understand because we're talking about thermal bridging and we, we are talking about the performance of a of a wall, of a exterior wall or exterior wall assembly, um, the more thermal clips or cladding attachments that are on a exterior wall, uh, the less performing the wall will be. Even though it is going to be a a thermal thermally broken system, but with more penetrations, you'll have more opportunities for thermal bridging. So it's also important to understand that the system that uh, um, an engineer or a designer is going with is designed or engineered for high load, high capacity that can handle um, high or maximum wind loads and dead loads uh, and can also be spaced a lot further than other systems um, to optimize uh, the exterior wall performance. Um, fire propagation is a very uh, hot topic, no pun intended, um, in the last several years and, and many components and many wall assemblies have gone through various forms of testing to, um, to sort of rule out any combustibility in components or any fire propagation elements and components um, that are part of different products. Um, because at the end of the day, there is there are human lives that are associated in buildings uh, that live in these buildings, and uh, of course, this is an image from the Grenfell Tower in UK. And many souls perished on that day when this building caught on fire, and it kind of again reminds us how important it is to really keep in mind um, uh, safety of uh, users and occupants. So, the most important test for uh, determining fire propagation is NFPA 285 in the US. Uh, the thing to note about NFPA 285 that it is not a component test. It is a test of an entire wall assembly uh, and a component. So a thermal uh, clip or a cladding attachment will be a component in the overall wall assembly. And that wall assembly is mounted on a testing rig, which kind of looks like something like you see in this diagram. Um, 
the way the test is performed is that a pilot uh, flame is lit on the inside, as you can see in the window, and it kind of uh, increases in intensity. Uh, eventually, this little opening creates the scenario of leap fire leapfrogging onto the exterior of the building, and the building is then it keeps burning. This raging inferno keeps on going for roughly 30 to 40 minutes. And what they are trying to assess through this uh, exercise is determine the extent of the, the, the range of the fire, uh, the height of the fire, and how, uh, and, and how the combustible components, if they are part of the building assembly, uh, whether or not they're aiding to that um, to, to, to that flame or not. The image on the right-hand side is actually an image of uh, a test that was, that a wall assembly that passed an NFPA 285 test, uh, as devastating as it looks. But they really want to gauge through <clears throat> the markings that they have on the left and the right-hand side of how high the flame travels in that 30 to 40 minute window. Uh, so we did talk about details, and I'll go over some details real quick of uh, how uh, product manufacturers can uh, uh, assist and provide value in the design process and are integral to the design process, in fact. Um, and some things that they should typically have are details that are part of their um, uh, you know, resource books or resource manuals, and you'll find many different uh, details uh, in this presentation that basically talks about different joints, either horizontal or vertical, uh, window head, window sill, window jams. Um, and again, the whole idea is for a thermally broken system at the end of the day, yes, it's creating a high performance wall, but it is creating the subsurface for the cladding product to be installed on. And if that product is not installed correctly, it can ultimately be traced back to the system upon which it's being installed on. And parapet details and termination details. So there are all these different details that can help designers figure out the best course of action for all the different intricacies of a project. Um, so to do a little bit of a recap before I can move into uh, talking a little bit about a specific product, um, is that energy conservation should be our collective goal. Um, building codes are challenging designers and building builders to adopt high performance methods and products. Um, energy conservation can be achieved by designing buildings that use less energy. And the best way that we know today as designers is to design with thermally broken cladding attachment systems and continuous insulation. Uh, we can get into some questions right now, uh, or I can perhaps finish the last couple of slides that I have. Uh, Kayla, what do you what do you recommend? Yeah, so actually, I do have one question for you, uh -huh. and that is coming from an individual named Jeb, and Jeb is asking: Is this with or without sheathing? The uh, most client systems that are. Uh, uh, that are on the market, uh, like they're installed, they're installed after the sheet, after the sheeting, but they're installed to the structural member. Now that structural member could be the steel stud or it could be the wood stud, um, but it's installed after the sheeting. Okay, perfect. Um, we don't have any other questions quite right now. Um, but yeah, we're going to have some more, I'm sure, in the next few minutes. So feel free to continue. Okay, awesome. Um, so I just like to take uh, the next uh, <clears throat> few moments here to talk about the Isoclip, which is a product by Northern Facades. Um, Isoclip is a um, uh, thermally broken structural attachment for cladding systems to the exterior wall assembly. Um, that significantly reduces thermal bridging within exterior rain screen assemblies and help achieve continuous insulation, resulting in improved, uh, improving insulation, effective R values and building envelope performance in general. 
Isoclips are available in three sizes to accommodate for insulation thicknesses. Uh, Isoclip is manufactured from 14 gauge galvalume or galvanized steel uh, with an integrated glass fiber reinforced polyamide isolator pad. Isoclips is an integral product that improves building energy efficiency through a reduction in thermal bridging, utilizing an optimized thermal pad design. Isoclip is designed for high load capacity. Less isoclips may be required uh, compared to synthetic or aluminum clips, which means less isoclips to install and less thermal bridging. Isoclip is simple and easy to install and is preferred by contractors and installers for achieving efficiencies during construction, resulting in cost savings. Perhaps the best advantage of Isoclip is its adjustability. <clears throat> it is adjustable for up to uh, plus or minus half an inch, uh, which is quite significant on a exterior wall. Um, in both directions, either horizontally or vertically, without the need for shims. Um, and it, it helps achieve continuous insulation, which, as we have probably uh, internalized through this presentation, is, uh, is the most necessary thing to achieve building codes or, or meet building codes. Um, Isoclips uh, built-in helping hand is designed for ease and speed of installation. Um, uh, and it's, it's incredibly important considering how crucial it is to meet construction deadlines. Uh, Isoclip is always installed in the same direction, regardless of horizontal or vertical girt orientation, and it's uh, North American need. Um, Isoclip has uh, extensive performance data and meets extensive performance requirements. Uh, 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 and has been validated by external engineering consultants for structural and thermal performance. Uh, and, and it has been evaluated for NFPA 285 and has been utilized in a successful NFPA 285 test. Um, it is fully engineered and acceptable for multiple substrates. Northern Facades is committed to sustainability and ensuring that our products uh, not only meet and exceed specification requirements and have minimum possible impact to the environment and the carbon footprint. As a component part, Isoclip may assist towards several lead credit points. Isoclip can be specified for salmon safe projects. Salmon safe is a standard that is developed in the Pacific Northwest to protect salmon habitats from the disruption of construction activity. In this case, it means any zinc runoff can be detrimental to salmon habitats. So to safeguard against that, our team developed a nylon coated clip. This allows Isoclip to protect downstream water quality and is consistent for use in salmon safe projects. Isoclip is also registered on the Living Futures Institute of Sustainable Products which has provided Isoclip with a DECLARE label, recognizing that Isoclip is free from any red listed chemicals and components, and upon the end of its life, is fully salvageable or reusable in its entirety, and it's 100% recyclable. Northern Facades has also developed an online tool called the Isoclip Calculator, uh, which is an online tool that can help designers during preliminary design stages, determine the wall performance by simply tweaking their wall assembly and by selecting different combinations of clips and wall types to achieve the required performance within the cladding, um, uh, uh, within, within the wall assembly. And for the type of cladding system uh, and, and, and the wind load criteria for that specific project. So it's a pretty comprehensive, pretty robust tool. And, and of course, if there are, there are applications that uh, you find yourself uh, in or situations you find yourself in that the calculator, uh, which exceed the parameter of the calculator, the Exoclip team is more than happy to help. Um, Isoclip uh, has very extensive technical support. <clears throat> uh, a lot of our product information can be found on isoclips.com. Um, of course, uh, Isoclip structural calculator is something that uh, I just uh, touched base on. But uh, a lot of our technical information is found in the box link. Feel free to reach out and I'll be more than happy to share that. Uh, 
we have all technical questions could be referred to uh, info at isoclips.com and isoclips uh, is also listed and can be found on leading specification platforms. And uh, that is all from my end. Uh, I would like to thank everyone again for uh, attending this uh, presentation today. And I hope it was a good learning experience for everyone and uh, it was valuable information. I'm 100% certain that is exactly the case, Bilal. I do have some questions that have come through. Are you open to answering a few? Absolutely. Fantastic. So I have one in, one person saying that I noticed on one of the details what appeared to be a washer that wasn't metallic, apparently further breaking the thermal bridge. But to what extent do the screws, presumably metal screws, generally contribute to thermal bridging? It's a very good question. And so there, the, one way to look at it is that uh, the way ASHRAE 90.1 describes uh, thermal bridging or a continuity or breaks in continuity is, or the exceptions that they create are, uh, are either through uh, fasteners uh, or through uh, mechanical uh, penetrations. Um, uh, in the case of isoclip, if I, if I may just go back a few slides, or maybe this is the probably good one. If you notice that the fasteners do continue from outside uh, and, and connect the uh, uh, studs, uh, connect to the studs, the overall clip is buried within the insulation. So the, the reason why isoclip will be, uh, will perform um, uh, to, to, the, to the standards that it is designed to is if it is embedded within the in layers of insulation. That gives it, is it, it that, not just isoclip, um, uh, but in fact, any, any, any other, any other, um, uh, any other product, if it's not, uh, if it's not buried within the insulation, it probably will not uh, perform as required. And the thermal washers uh, would provide minim minimal benefit. Um, uh, if, if, if they are part of a particular product. Okay, very interesting. So I have another question. What country is the ISO clip manufactured in? And what sure. fasteners are shown with the ISO clip? For sure, yeah. So uh, ISO clip is manufactured, currently manufactured in Canada, but it's uh, shipped all over North America from Canada. Um, the fasteners, we have a list of uh, uh, fasteners that uh, are recommended. And of course, uh, project engineers could swap them out. But the ones that you see are quarter inch uh, uh, number 14 fasteners. These are the ones for the steel studs. And there, there could be different ones for concrete or wood studs. I think the ones for steel studs and wood studs are the same. Awesome. Um, Pat and then for concrete. Excuse me, oh. they're tap cons for concrete. Oh, tap cons. Okay, perfect. How do you deal with condensation in these walls? So the way condensation uh, uh, sort of finds its way into the wall is when the dew point uh, within within the dew, dew point is outside, uh, not within the stud cavity, uh, and. Uh, in most of the buildings that are a little bit older, uh, you'll find condensation around windows. And there was this one hospital that I went to where they had uh, a baseboard heating system and a window right above it. And because there was no exterior insulation and it was so frigidly cold outside, the heater was uh, definitely trying to keep the space warm. A baseboard heater was trying to space, keep the space warm. But because of all the air leakage and the dew point moving inside of the wall cavity, the window was completely drenched and soaked in, in condensation. So exterior insulation, what it does is 
it enables that dew point to fall within the layers of insulation because that's really where you want it to be. Uh, if it's not in between those layers, then there's going to be condensation or interstitial condensation for sure. Uh, dew point analysis, there are many different tools that are there to determine that. Uh, a lot of building envelope consultants offer dew point analysis on assemblies that are designed by architects. So there are many tools that are out there and many resources to, to glean from um, to eliminate any kind of risk of, of uh, uh, condensation um, when detailing. Fantastic. And I think this might be our last question. Mm -hmm. So this is coming from uh, Brant and he is asking from the 2018 RDH study that you quoted, do you have any updates? And further, why would designers choose something other than long screws through insulation based on that data? That is an excellent question. I'm, I'm so glad you were paying attention, Brent. Um, so uh, uh, you're right in terms of thermal performance. Yes, long screws for sure uh, are a um, total, uh, they're, they're totally leading. But Long screws have limitations when they deal when they're when with the, with the, with the type of cladding product that's being um, that's being uh, you know attached. So, for example, in the in the in the detail that I have on the screen right now, uh, there's like an NCM panel with a clip um, or a rail system. Um, it's very difficult to achieve that with long screws, but if you're detailing some sort of siding or any kind of siding, long screws is the way to go. We would probably not even advise using isoclip for that kind of application. So there are, there are different um, there are different nuances, but there are many different variables, I would say. Um, and same goes for other systems like mechanically fastened um, uh, brick or masonry products or any kind of products that use rails or clips. You need to have uh, girts in place and you need to have uh, or some sort of soft framing in place um, and long screws don't necessarily uh, or aren't necessarily designed for that application. Okay well I think those are all the questions if anyone has any questions while I'm giving the final outro please feel free to leave them in there and I'll try and sneak them in immediately following. But thank you so much, Bilal. We so appreciate your time and thank you everybody else for joining us today. Again, we 100% appreciate you joining us. You will be, uh, anyone who needs that AIA credit, it will be immediately processed. You should see that within one to two weeks. If you have any questions about this topic, please feel free to reach out to either MetalCon or you can reach out to Bilal as well. We are both happy to answer questions that you may have. If you need any other credits, you will be receiving that certificate and that certificate will have all the information that you need to maintain your crediting for any other organizations. We hope you'll join us in two weeks on March 2nd with Keith Wentworth and the MBCEA. Thank you again, everybody for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and a very special thank you to Bilal. Bye everyone. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you everybody.